was in San Diego. I was in San Diego for a week, so I was taking care of the chaplains of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. But it's an honor to be here this morning. Uh, Pastor Ruland is, is uh, doing well. He's resting at home, and he'll be back to join us shortly. As you know, Pastor Fiebelkorn's downstairs leading the Bible study. So we begin our worship as we stand and sing our opening hymn. Blessed be God, who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and rich in love. God does not treat us as our sins deserve, nor punish us according to our guilt, but looks upon us in compassion, forgives our sins, and heals our lives. Therefore, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. O oh God, in your goodness have mercy upon us. In your compassion cleanse us from our sin and take away our guilt. Create in us a new heart and give us a steadfast spirit. Do not cast us away, but fill us with your Holy Spirit and restore your joy within us. As tender as a father is to his child, so gentle is God with you. As high as heaven is above the earth, so vast is God's love for you. As far as the east is from the west, so far God removes your sin from you, renewing your life through Jesus Christ. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be God who crowns us with mercy and love.
for peace from above and for the saving power of God, let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading today comes from Jeremiah, chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms, to pluck up and to break down, 
to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. And now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, 
but the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Jesus went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now, when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him, and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. You're seated.
friends. It is awesome to see you in church this morning. Okay, I would like everybody to raise their hands. You can raise them both if you want. Oh, good job, Amelia. Okay, now bring them down and really look at them. Hmm, flip them over, sure. Mm-hmm. You know, our hands are really special. What can your hands do? Think about some good things that your hands can do. Yes. Yeah, you can touch stuff like maybe pet your dog, your cat. Yes. Yeah, you can grab stuff that you need and maybe to help somebody. Yeah, we can tie our shoes, right? We can write and draw with our hands. So many awesome things. Okay, now, I don't like to think about this, but are there things we can do with our hands that are kind of like bad choices? Sometimes we push someone. Yeah, that's not, that's not good. Yes. Yeah, sometimes we hit. Uh, it's really sad when we use our hands like that. Scratch. Well, scratching is, oh, scratch. Yeah, no, that's right, that's right. Jesus knows how special and wonderful hands are. He used his hands to do amazing things. In fact, today's Bible reading says that any who were sick came to him and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Jesus often used his hands for healing. He knew how to use his hands to help people and to love people. So I want to give each of you something today to remind you to use your hands in a loving way. When you see this sticker heart on your hand, you can remember how Jesus used his hands to help and comfort and touch those around him. Be thankful for your hands and use them like Jesus did. In fact, we'll fold our hands now and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, take our hands and use them to do good, kind things. Amen. Okay, you can come get a sticker and return to your seats. Thanks so much for coming up. Grace, peace, and mercy be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Some have said that these are some of the most beautiful words ever spoken in the English language. Perhaps that's why so many couples choose to have them read at their wedding, as my wife and I did. There's something wonderful about this picture of love that comes together with these 15 different descriptors. 
It paints this uh, elusive image, like fog on the mirror, of the kind of love that we all search for and the kind of love that we all seek to be. Patient as the most attentive father, kind as the most dear friend, as pleasing as the coworker who celebrates your promotion, as polite as a stranger offering you his umbrella. But reach out and rub the fog off the mirror and take a good long look at who's staring back at you. This passage may indeed be beautiful, but it's also terrifying. Because if we ever dare turn it on ourselves, it reveals something that we'd much rather keep hidden. That this standard of love is not truly reflected by us oftentimes in our lives and in our relationships. You know, instead of patience, we pressure those we love to meet our anxious needs. Instead of kindness, we thrust the effects of our stress upon one another, irritably speaking words with passive aggression and resentment. Far from bearing all things, our love has limits and breaking points and moments when we say, no more. Paul writes that love never ends. But it certainly does seem that it does for us. Whether for a stranger who asks for your help in the grocery store line, or a friend who's having yet another breakdown, or your kid who keeps needing your help after school night after night, or the spouse for whom feelings seem to have since long faded, love ends. And perhaps if that was all there was to it, I could proclaim to you the forgiveness that has been truly earned for you by Christ's death upon the cross, implore you to be better, and we could all go home. But I can't do that. Because our lack of love is not quite like other sins. Paul says that of the virtues of faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love because it is the only one that truly endures forever. The only one in which God turns our attention towards those he has placed in our lives and calls us to action. He writes... If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is the one thing that we can't do without. It's like to be a Christian without love is like trying to bake a cake without flour. You know, whatever you end up with, whatever else that you put in there, it's just not going to be a cake. John, the writer of one of the Gospels, once wrote, Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. When we fail to have love, it's no ordinary failure, but the failure to know God, who is the love as described here. So we must ask ourselves the same question that Paul asked the church in Corinth almost 2,000 years ago. They were a congregation riddled with conflict and controversy. Members were suing each other. Marriages were falling apart. Their unity with one another was almost non-existent. And yet they were very confident in their faith, in their gifts, in their programs, but none of that matters in the face of the essential question, do you have love? After John wrote that God is love, he followed it up like this. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That idealistic, that impossible image of love, the one that we could never live up to, is the love that God has for you as you sit here this morning. He sent his son to show that he is slow to anger and patient in love. 
Jesus loved with kindness all those who came to, them, came to him, even those whom the society despised. And without arrogance or pride, he sat down and ate with sinners like you and me. And when faced with the cross, he did not think about himself or his own suffering, but of you and of all people first. And despite the rejection that he experienced there, he still cried out about those crucifying him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He never tolerated sin, but he always rejoiced in repentance and offered forgiveness to everyone without exception through him. On the cross, Jesus bore all things, our sin and our shame, because of his love for us. He believed in the Father. He hoped in the promises for God's people, and he endured all suffering for our sake so that we could be forgiven. And the love of Jesus will last for all time, never fading or waning for even a second. His love never ends. Jesus loves in this ideal and perfect way without failure or mistake. But what I hope that you see here is that this makes love more than a virtue, more than a feeling. This means that love is a person. See, I'm not speaking of a general love here. I'm speaking of a very particular and peculiar type of love that is Jesus Christ. His life, his way, is the very definition of love for us. And it's not only that Jesus does this particular kind of love perfectly, but more that this peculiar kind of love can only be done by Christ. Only Christ can embody the sacrificial love that asks for nothing in return, but gives all. Only Christ can love the sinner for all that they're worth and so much more, even if it costs him everything. Only Christ can love without end. Now, for those of you who have been paying attention, you might have noticed that I've really backed myself into a corner here. I I said at the beginning that while we aspire to this love, we always fail, and that our love is limited and lacking. But I also said that it was essential. And now I'm saying that only Christ can love in this way. So how can we possibly reconcile these things? Am I saying that we don't really need love because Christ has it for us? Well, no. Because while we do indeed have the love shown to us by Christ, and because of that, God views us as perfect, as if we have the love of Christ ourselves, we can't lose sight of the present. After all, Christ, after all, Paul is clearly speaking to people like you and me and calling us to love. So then, am I now going to ask you to do the impossible and to love exactly like Christ? Well, no, I'm not going to do that either, because while that would perhaps be inspirational... And it's good to view Christ as an example for us. How would we do that when the love of Christ is Christ himself? It's a real pickle. So what do we do? Let me tell you a story. Suppose that your husband or your wife comes to you one night and says, Listen, honey, I I have something I need to to tell you. I, I want you to sit down. I've been having an affair. And it hits you like a ton of bricks. You never saw this coming, never thought that this would happen to you. And they start to apologize, but all you can think about is how your life is ruined. Did those 15 years of marriage mean nothing? What will everyone else say? And your mind, it goes back to your wedding day and you hear the words that were spoken there. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And you think, that's impossible. And you tune back in and you hear them asking you, what are you going to do now? Because they want to work it out with you, but they aren't, they aren't sure how to make this work. And you aren't either. Alone, what can you do? Well, that's the thing. You aren't alone. You remember that on the day that you were married, you stood in the church before the community and you pledged your love and your faithfulness. So you come back to that community of Christ, the church, and any other community would probably not be able to truly help 
But what the church offers is not from herself, but from Christ. They will not, they cannot be judgmental or refuse to help. Because Christ's love is specifically for those who sin and are in need. The church becomes the ears which listen to the pain, both yours and theirs. The mouth which speaks the words of Christ's forgiveness and words of hope and healing to both of you. The community lifts up your family. They become the hands which feed and care for your children while you attend counseling. They bring the love of Christ which refuses to give up on what God has called good and hold you up, enduring and bearing all things with you. Christ makes what would have been impossible possible. The love that they give, the love of Christ they give, is not a general love, but a very particular and peculiar one that is connected to Jesus Christ. It's a love which sees others, whether they be a stranger, a friend, a child, or a spouse, as one's whom Jesus loves and died for, and so whom they love as well. And this is the secret to showing the kind of love that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians. We give what is not ours. We do not give our own love, which will end and fail. We give the love which is Christ, The love which never ends and never fails. And we don't ask whether they're worthy to receive it. Christ has already decided that when he died on the cross for them. We don't ask whether they've earned it because Jesus has already earned it for them. And we don't ask whether we are enough because we know that Jesus is. And that love enables us to tackle things that we would otherwise never be able to handle. And what's more, we don't do this alone. But we do it together within the community that God has placed us in. God does not call you towards this way of love alone. But he has brought you into this place and connected you with all of these people so that together we would share Christ and his peculiar love with others. And we do this not by relying on our own abilities or talents or connections, but by being in Christ together. Together, we become the way in which Christ works his love in the world. And we share the love that is not from ourselves, but the love that is Jesus Christ. This is why Paul says that a community that does not have love is nothing. Because without that love, we don't have Christ because it's his love. So my call for us today is simply this. Let us be in Christ together. And let us give his love. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please rise as we now confess together our common faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all those who are in need. Gracious Creator, your Son commanded demons and they obeyed him. 
so that afflicted people were set free. Cast out the forces of darkness, both open and hidden in our world. Give courage, faith, peace, and relief to our brotherhood throughout the world who suffer for the sake of Christ. And uphold your children in your care. Lord, in your mercy. Holy One, your Son taught with authority. Through those called into his holy ministry, use that authority to forgive sins, strengthen faith, and empower lives of good works, that the people of this world would see your love in us. Lord, in your mercy. Forgive our sins, Lord, especially the false acts that cannot pass for real love. Enable us to reflect your love, which is patient and kind, does not envy or boast, is not arrogant or rude, and does not insist on its own way. Fill our lives with good works that truly care for others. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you know all things, and the words of your mouth stand over nations and kingdoms, able to pluck up and break down, destroy and overthrow. Rule by your might that our nation may be governed and preserved. Do not let us be dismayed as citizens in this world or of your kingdom, for you are king above all. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, arise. Forget not the afflicted, but hear their desires and strengthen their hearts, especially Jane, and Ned, Sam, Earl, Jessica, Kathy, Sandy, Catherine, Mark, Joe, Jamie, Gary, Josh, and Jamie, as well as those we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for Linda and for Teresa and for all who have lived and died with faith in Christ and now rest in your presence. Unite us with your Son and with all those saints as we eat and drink his life-giving blood, his body and blood at this altar. Grant us repentant hearts as we receive your gifts and strengthen us to care for the needs of others in the way of Christ, our Savior, Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please rise. The Lord be with you. 
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper and when he had given thanks he gave it for all to drink saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
body of Christ given to you, so forgive us of all your sins. Take, drink, chew of Christ. Take, drink, chew of Christ. May the Lord bless you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace.
Let us pray. God of all creation, in this meal you have bound us to yourself. At this table we have tasted your goodness. Strengthen us by your strength that we might ever more perfectly praise you and more faithfully love one another through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you 